the hierarchy of human beings whose footprints on history can never be erased for good or ill, he was perhaps unique. He was small and unkempt, brilliant and pitiless and unforgettable. He was adored and execrated in life and almost deified in death. He is remembered today wherever men's affairs have a meaning, with veneration or hatred, but never without respect. His name was Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov, known as Lenin. On the shores of the Volga, in a Tatar country, in the very landlocked center of the enormous empire of Russia, was the town of Simbirsk, one provincial town out of thousands. There, in 1870, in the respectable, solid, bourgeois home of a provincial bureaucrat, was born Vladimir Ilyich, the third child and second son. His family was simple and secure. His father was a government inspector of schools, a man of character and cultivation, Ilya Nikolaevich Ulyanov. Around them were always the reminders that to oppose the regime meant suffering. A thousand miles away in St. Petersburg, when the young Ulyanov was 17, the thing happened that was to shadow his life like a scar. His sister Anna and his older brother Alexander were implicated in a plot to kill the Tsar. Alexander was arrested, asked for no mercy, and was hanged. It was then that in his heart, Vladimir Ilyich became Lenin and committed his brain and his body to one end only, the revolution. From then on he was marked the brother of an assassin. At Kazan he was involved in a student's protest and banished from the university. Already he had discovered Karl Marx, his personal revelation, the manual for his own place in history. Denied the right to study, he went to rusticate with his family near Samara. It wasn't hard for a rebel to find fuel for his fury in the country life around, in a Russia of a hundred million peasants who lived their racked and wretched lives forever on the edge of famine, scratching what they could from their outworked and ungenerous earth. was not difficult in the Russia of Vladimir Ilyich Lenin to feel a bitter and ineradicable certainty of human wrong. It had to change. They let Lenin into St. Petersburg at last, to the law school. Here was the other side of the Russian picture, the urban proletarian picture. Here, as he sailed through his four-year law course in one year, he reached his creed that today's revolutions are born always in cities. On this proposition, he began to work. In his worker's lodging, he met the girl Nadezhda Konstantinova Krupskaya, the militant feminist Marxist, who by and by became his wife. Russia was changing, slowly groping to the new 19th century industrialization. The 19th century factories and workshops were huge and primitive. They were, like Russia, on a monstrous scale and, like Russia, suffocated in their own ineffectual size. In them grew a seething and inarticulate resentment expressed in all manner of groups of protest, the incoherent raw material of revolt with neither motive power nor guide. In the huge oil fields of Baku, rebellion was lost, as everywhere else, in an almost unconquerable pit of apathy.
And above it all, ineffably remote, lingered the strangest phenomenon of all. For 400 years, the Tsars had ruled. And here was the last, Nikolai Alexandrovich Romanov. By the grace of God, Emperor of all the Russias. Tsar of Moscow and Kiev, Tsar of Astrakhan, Tsar of Poland and Siberia, Grand Duke of Lithuania and Finland, and much else. In 1895, Lenin went abroad for the first time, and in Geneva he met the founding father of the Russian socialist movement, Georgi Valentinovich Plekhanov, living in exile. Lenin was to become his bitter foe, but not yet. So he returned to Russia and founded with Julius Martov the forbidden League of Struggle for the Liberation of the Working Class. And he was arrested. For 14 months he stayed in jail. There was, of course, no question of a trial. Yes, he had abundant books and he had no special trouble smuggling out of prison the revolutionary tracts he was there for writing. He grew expert at the techniques of invisible writing and ciphers. At the end of his time, they sent him to Siberia. It took him two months to reach his place of exile, the Chushinskoya, far to the east. There he waited and hunted and shot and read and wrote interminably. Two years later, Nadezhda Krupskaya, too, was exiled to Siberia. The authorities obligingly let her join Lenin, and there she and Lenin were married. By now, the Social Democrats were on the run. Lenin found his way to Munich, where, with Martov and Petrosov in 1900, he founded the rebel paper Iskra, the spark. It was smuggled into Russia by many people, among them the young Georgian activist Joseph Jugasvili, later to be known as Stalin. The paper Iskra became the underground gospel of Russian socialism. The workers' cells began to form in secret, everywhere. Lenin's real wanderings began. His restless search for a secure base brought him and Krupska in 1902 to London, forever writing, haunting the British Museum reading room. Already the exiles were obsessed by their own internal conflicts. Sometimes it seemed the technique of revolution was more important than the end. But the flood of advice and instruction filtered back to the Russian underground. In Russia, the mounting miseries suddenly found a momentary expression in a wave of strikes and risings. And Lenin was still far away. It was the Tsar's bad luck, or folly, that brought at this moment the Russian war against Japan. A futile war, destined for disaster. In Russia, wars have always carried revolution in their wake. But the 1905 revolt began in a peaceful protest of almost excessive loyalty. A quiet priest called Father Gapon led 200,000 men, women and children to the Winter Palace, singing God Save the Tsar and praying simply for an eight-hour day. And the guards opened fire on them. More than 500 died. That was the bloody Sunday of January 1905. Everywhere the crowds came out in a chain of outbursts, defying the Cossacks, driven to a desperation of protest Russia had not known before. <laughs> this, thought Lenin from afar, must be it. The time for which he had planned. He hurried back to St. Petersburg. But he was wrong. The rising was crushed, the leaders imprisoned. In Moscow, the strikers held out a little longer, furiously encouraged by Lenin. 